I'll tell you our objective here today, and an hour from now we're going to take a vote and ask ourselves after what we've heard from these marvelous companies and what they've done, is there a chance that in America we can bring back manufacturing to the point and the state it was 40 years ago? And we have to be honest with each other because that's what the president's political mandate is, or at least get us in that direction. And I don't want politics here today. I want to talk about strategy. But we can't ignore the fact that there is a mandate from on high in this country to bring back manufacturing jobs. And so one of the important questions to answer today will be, is that important from 20 years from now? Does that really matter, number one? Number two, is that going to hurt the competitive nature of America if we do that? But what's important is we're going to hear from companies that are actually doing just that, doing 100% of their manufacturing distribution into the, the most, of, most of the logistics right here in America. And, and they are successful. So we have to learn, A, what they do and how they do it. And then I want to make sure we spend at least a third of this hour together in QA. We, we want to ask them and ask the big questions of the day as to whether or not this is the trend of the future or a blip or an investment strategy or a competitive advantage. So let's start with the description of who we got up here, because I want you to understand what their businesses are. So I'm going to introduce each one and then ask them for a two-minute elevator pitch to explain what they do so we understand the relevance of what they've achieved in American manufacturing. Let's start right now with Neil. You're the co-founder and COO of Casper, very famous mattress maker. Tell us how you do it and what you do. You've got 120 seconds. All right, I'll try to be quick. Um, how many of you have enjoyed buying a mattress before? Not many people. Uh, you know, so we look at the traditional industries that have been a racket. You know, the the mattress industry was very sleepy for a long time. There were, ah, uh, see, uh, <laughs> there. Uh, you know, we have products that are not great. Uh, supply chain that's broken. You know, the, the traditional. Mattress manufacturers have really been not very honest with uh, with folks in the United States, and we set out to change that. And you know, kind of riding on this shift and this idea that sleep is actually more important than ever to people around the world. And so it's not actually just about a mattress, but since launching three years ago, we've really put a focus into doing a lot of R&D about helping people sleep better. So now we've got sheets and pillows and all kinds of other technologies that go into your bedroom to, to, to help you sleep better. And we do the, not 100%, but the vast majority of our manufacturing is done here in the United States. Um, and you know, for us, it's been a, been a blessing to be able to work with some really amazing manufacturers, create you know hundreds, if not thousands, of jobs here. Thank you, Zachary. You are the founder and CEO of Love Your Melon. Tell us what you do. So the truest form of entrepreneurship is a lemonade stand. The kids on the street selling lemonade to you. And we were in a class project, 2012, in entrepreneurship at the University of St. Thomas, and we had to start a business called the Lemonade Stand Project. And that's when we came up with Love Your Melon. And we set out to create a high-end fashionable beanie made right here in the United States, and this is what we came up with. We set out to run this class project and make 400 beanies, 200 to sell and 200 to give away to children battling cancer. And within a few weeks, we had done that. We sold out in two days, and then we went and gave away these hats to these kids. And we knelt down by their bedsides and spent time with them while they were in the hospital and gave them a reason to smile. And that's what the entire point to Love Your Melon was about, was creating a community of people that were supporting each other, supporting those in jobs in US manufacturing, those in the children's hospitals, those families going through that, and then getting college kids into the hospitals to make a difference in their lives. We've moved forward now. We've sold over a million beanies. We've provided a hat to every kid battling cancer in America. And we've donated over $2.7 million to cancer research and family support. And now we've launched our wholesale and custom programs, and then a huge product line that goes beyond beanies into scarves, blankets, and everything else we can see in US knit that we can be a powerful play in. Thank you. All right. All domestic. And staying on the domestic theme, Tanya, you're the co-founder and CMO of Makers Row. Tell us what that company does in America. Yeah, and I'm, so I'm going to start a little bit further um, back. My father was actually a factory worker when I was growing up. And, but I didn't get into manufacturing until I was in New York working at Goldman. And I actually quit my job there to co-own a leather goods line and found it was extremely difficult to find American manufacturers. 
And so I convinced my business partner to start a tech company that makes it easier to find American manufacturers. At the time, it was actually easier to find a Chinese manufacturer than it was to find an American manufacturer. Um, so we now serve over 130,000 businesses, um, including Zach's, Love Your Melon, um, is a customer of Maker's Row. And, um, and so we basically help businesses and entrepreneurs um, bring their ideas to life and partner with the American manufacturer. So very specifically, if you're, you have an idea and you're compelled to build it in America, your platform provides the other side of that equation, the manufacturers that are domestic that can solve the problems for you. Exactly. OK, so a B2B strategy. All right. <coughs> Bayard, founder and CEO of American Giant. Tell us what it does and why you do it here. Uh, so uh, about six years ago, I was, I was taking a hard look at what was happening in the apparel world specifically and was struck by two things. I think one was this uh, fundamental shift underway away from traditional retail and wholesale distribution models and a rapid move by younger customers, particularly towards brands that they cared about and that thought stood for something that mattered to them. Um, and I was also uh, living in San Francisco and surrounded by uh, these incredible leaps in technology and sort of refusals to accept no about uh, potential breakthroughs in industry after industry. And I was sitting with all that and, and thinking about the fact that 40 years ago we could make a great champion sweatshirt in North Carolina that my mom could afford at Caldors, and 40 years later we couldn't anymore. And that, and that was enough to get me looking into the problem um, about what had changed, and a lot had changed, uh, inventory stuff, distribution stuff, marketing, a whole bunch of things. Um, but we got a lot of conviction early on that if you, if you brought to bear uh, sort of best practices, you could launch a great apparel brand entirely domestically sourced uh, do it profitably, um, and resonate with a younger generation of, of consumers. So we started the business in 2011. We, we use a bunch of the Toyota engineering approaches to make our manufacturing as efficient it can be and, and look to be as, as nimble and as modern in our thinking about the way that we think about our supply chain as possible so that we keep the business pretty competitive. Okay, so that's a great segue into the real debate we have to address today. And here it is by the numbers. And it's particularly germane to the discussion going on about jobs in America. What drove so much manufacturing out of this country was the fact that between 6 and 8% of the cost of making goods could be removed from the income statement of pretty well any business in any sector by offshoring a lot of the manufacturing process for a wide range of reasons. Apple doesn't make its phones in America. Its IP comes from America but it employs millions of people in other countries to make the phones at a lower cost. And today that delta, that difference, <coughs> is about 8%. When you consider that in most sectors of the economy, the S&P 500, an efficient country, a company makes 15% pre-tax, regardless of what sector you're in, 8% is a lot, a lot. In fact, when it was proposed that a border adjustment tax be imposed on companies that are bringing in goods made outside of America, Walmart was the strongest lobby to go to Washington and say, are you out of your mind? We feed America, we clothe America, we sell bikes to America, we do everything we can for America by buying inexpensive goods. So when we're gonna ask each of these companies now, because they have gone the other way, they are exactly the antithesis of this. They are building and shipping and making in America. So if you're an investor, and a third of you are, because if you're in retirement, your investments are what's going to keep you going. You're betting on the American economy to get you a return on your dollars. And you have two companies to invest in. Doesn't matter what sector. One manufactures offshore and has currently, supposedly, an 8% advantage to profit and can have dividends that are 8% larger as a result of that. Right beside it is an American competitor that has decided, for reasons that we'll discuss now, to stay in America, but it has margins 8% less because it's burdened by the full cost of manufacturing in America. So let's test that thesis first, because that's the premise. That's the reason that many manufacturers do not want to give up offshore manufacturing. There's a huge cost advantage. Why cars are made in Mexico, why the apparel industry was decimated, why socks are made in Asia, not in America, why practically not a shoe on your foot here is made in this country. These are all the reasons why 
the 8% solution has changed the manufacturing base in America. And yet, these companies have gone against that. So let's test the thesis first. Bayer, 8%. Aren't you really hurting your investors with this whole American dream thing? Uh, <laughs> I, think it's the, I think it's the right way to think about the problem, right? Which is, uh, can the business digest incremental costs of 8% by offsetting those costs someplace else in the P&L? And so we were talking before the panel that I think one provocative question on that, on that front is to ask yourselves, if you assume for a second that Amazon is going to consume the world, <laughs> uh, which they are, and Walmart, I think the two of them together, right? Uh, what brands are going to thrive in that dynamic? And I would argue that the brands that are, are not particularly concerned about that uh, rapid evolution are brands that customers love. Um, so I think that if you unpack that a bit and ask yourself, what do you, the brands that you love that you're not going to go to Amazon for, maybe it's Patagonia, uh, what is it about that company that wants you to stay loyal to that brand, to lower their marketing burden, their retention burden? Uh, and so I think that when you begin to look at, I think, different versions for all of us on the panel about the things that offset that 8%, what you find is younger consumers particularly are asking harder questions about brands and the brands they want to be loyal to. And that offsets a lot of the retail burdens, marketing burdens, retention burdens that traditional businesses, certainly in apparel, have borne for a long time. And so I think that's the answer. I think it's the right way to frame it. But, uh, and you do have to put the right pressure, I think, on management to a answer it. Our answer is that we think that you retain your customers more, you can drive better quality, you can get new customers more easily, uh, and those more than offset the delta in, in labor costs by staying domestic. So, uh, just to be clear, are you suggesting one of two things? One, that you can actually find enough efficiency to make the 8% delta go away and not be material anymore, or are you suggesting that because it's made in America, you can force the consumer to pay more in perpetuity to support the American vision of manufacturing? Uh, Which is it? I'm saying that in, in today's consumer environment, consumers are asking much harder questions of brands. And I think that's putting massive downward pressure in, in our world on The Gap and Abercrombie and American Eagle and a bunch of these brands that are trying to figure out why they're no longer resonating with consumers. And it is supporting and lifting brands that are standing for things. Broadly defined, that could be American made, it could be environmentalism, it could be quality, it could be better sleep, it could be whatever it is that you're particularly honing in on. And I think if you can offset the tough, the, biz, the tough thing about business is getting your customers and retaining them and get them to stay loyal to the brand. And I would argue that younger consumers today, and our business certainly reflects that, are responding to brands that are taking a stand in a world that feels like precious few brands in the apparel world are doing that. So it's brand. Okay. I let's, think it's let's, test that, <laughs> let's test that on mattresses. I'm going to shake uh, it up a little bit here. Mattresses, cheapest mattress I can get, and I'm, if I'm cost conscious, from China. Yeah, for sure. So why should I overpay for yours? So uh, <laughs> I wouldn't want to sleep on one of those beds. Uh, <laughs> So let's take a step back for a second, right? I think when we started uh, the business, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, right? I didn't even know that manufacturing in how to do that, right? I'd never really made anything before. And so, you know, we picked up the phone and started calling people. Um, you know, there was this amazing manufacturer in Georgia, and we tried to figure out who makes the best. If we, we had an idea to create a foam bed that would actually sleep a lot cooler, but would still remain bouncy and kind of have a hybrid product that would, uh, a lot more people would like. So to make that, we had to go and find the best polymer chemistry in the world. And it turned out that a lot of the best polymer chemistry in the world, because the best chemistry in the world, is still coming out of the United States. So we knew that actually like, the best access to technology was here. Second to that, in today's fast-moving environment, um, you know, we're making changes to our product every two to four weeks on the line. Right? We're continuously getting feedback from our customers, relaying that back into our line and, and adjusting it. Right? So if we were manufacturing abroad, right, where it might have been OK when you're turning things every year or every two years. right? If you're buying from one of the big mattress companies, they made that product. And by the time it gets into your home, it's probably been 18 months old, right? because it's gone from uh, their manufacturer to the distributor to the retail store to their warehouse to your home. And so there is actually a lot of advantages to being nimble and being able to change your strategy in real time as the market's, as the market's developing. Um, and you know, I think at the end of the day, there are a lot of customers who do care about things made in their communities, right? Like I would say it's not the primary concern. I don't think people buy Casper because it's made in America only, right? Of course they want a great night's sleep, but when it goes down their, their list of things and they're comparing between two things and it's like, well, I think these two things can give me great sleep, but this one's made in America within 300 miles of my local community and that's actually creating jobs, like that's definitely a plus.
So it's brand again in some ways, right? I think it's brand and competitive advantage, right? It actually, it, it does help us win against the... But there's no debate. You're both successfully doing it. So you're staying in business. You're profitable. It's working. So there's hope. Zachary, what you're doing is almost, um, it's quasi-business, but it's also got a moral and social issue it's addressing, right? Yeah, it's pretty clear that our goal is not simply to make a profit by running Love Your Melon. I mean, even at the end of the day, though, after doing U.S. manufacturing and giving all that we give, we're still on our income statement bringing back 15%. And so we're figuring out a way to make that 8% go away pretty quickly. And I think that are you being supported there, in some philanthropic way to get that 8%? Be honest with us. I think it's social media advertising, to be honest. We're figuring out a way in a non-traditional marketing sense to get in front of consumers in a much cheaper fashion than is traditional, than most big companies can even like adapt to. But we run five photo shoots a week. We're always getting new content from our ambassador program, from doing all of our philanthropic model pieces, which also play into it. And you can't downgrade that at all. But we're also getting in front of these people at a much more cost-effective standard than putting it in a magazine. Tanya, you're guilty of actually facilitating American Manifest. <laughs> so you are the enemy of Alibaba. Come to, just this week, came and made a claim that globalization is ultimately going to survive regardless of what politicians want, because at the end of the day, every good idea wants to be done and manufactured, distributed efficiently around the world, and they're the platform to do it. That was the pitch he made. And here you are saying, no, 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 no. We can do it in America. I can show you how. Why is that going to work long term? So I think that American manufacturing, for it to continue to be in existence, has to make business sense. I think that it, I think it helps when there's a moral um, and like ethical argument, but I think it has to make business sense. And for our businesses, it makes sense because they get smaller batches, the time to market is shortened, and they're able to collaborate with manufacturers in real time and communicate with manufacturers in real time. <coughs> I know, I, I had to order 400 hats, and oddly enough, we started exactly the same time, so when I was looking for a manufacturer, I used Maker's Row. And that's what made it possible, because like you brought up with mattresses, you didn't know what you were doing, I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't know how to make a beanie, but there's somebody out there in America that spoke our language, that was able to work with us one-on-one -on -one in person, was able to teach us, and that's the coolest part of what you do. It's really amazing. Um, I appreciate that plug, Zachary. I didn't. I didn't pay him for that. Um, <laughs> but um, but so I, I think it's all of those things, and I think that a trend and similar to what um, Bayard Bayard was saying was that um, I think that people entrepreneurs are now building products that are for their own communities, and so pe what we see customers looking for, they're not looking for mass market anymore. They're looking for something that tells a story, something that speaks to them, and. Um, for a lot of entrepreneurs, man American manufacturing makes more sense to start. Let's delve into the area of politics. In the last 100 days, there have been some very large companies in America that have been called out specifically by the president as they contemplated moving their manufacturing to lower cost jurisdictions. And all of a sudden, they were the focus of all the national news for 48 hours. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they changed their minds or they at least made it look like they changed their minds. But here's the question I want you to answer me on behalf of all the sectors. If you're, let's, let's use a car manufacturer, because they have very heavy costs, and they're now competing globally. No matter what you think a car is going to turn into in the next 20 years, it may end up being just a box with an electric motor and four wheels brand won't matter. But let's, let's leave that aside. If you're going to compete in the car business, and it's global now, India, China, Europe, all competing with you, don't you owe your shareholders and your customers the most efficient manufacturing model, even if that means you build it in Mexico? And should you be pressured by one individual that could maybe only be in power for 36 more months <laughs> to change a multi-billion dollar plant decision? How do you as entrepreneurs feel about watching this happen? They obviously had to make that decision to say the story preserving that and not looking bad in the press was worth more than keeping it in America. Car plant that's is a 20-year decision. But we're doing all of that now today without being pressured by the president. And we're deciding that it's more important for our story and our authenticity 
and preserving our communities to do it. But you know, it's almost unfair for you to say that, Zachary, because you're so nimble, you can go make a hat anywhere. You can't do that when you're building a car that you have to plan three years from now that's gonna be manufactured. Does that change the way you look at that? I think, it, I think it does, though, depending on what you're manufacturing, right? I think a car plant is an interesting example because when it comes to advanced manufacturing, right, there are actually a lot of really high quality jobs that can go into certain types of plants, right? We know, you know, I'm sure with all of our businesses, there's also some types of manufacturing which, you know, it is not the best kind of place to work and you're not gonna want, you know, it, it's not particularly high paying, it's not, you know, actually supporting those communities, et cetera. And so I think you also have to figure out like, you know, should we do all of our manufacturing in America? Should we pick selectively? Like, let's go after these certain categories that we think are gonna be both good for our economy and good for those people. Because I don't see a world in which we're gonna say, you know, we're gonna vertically integrate the entire country and everything that we consume, make, et cetera, forever is gonna be made here in the US. Yeah, you're correct. The machines that make certain components of our hats can't be made in America, or the companies making them are unwilling to. And there are certain parts of the economy that never will be able to be made in America again understanding from a cost standpoint that everything would fall apart. Okay, what do you say? It's terrible, right? I mean, you're just defying every economic trend that's been happening for the last 75 years. I think, you know, I think when you think about American labor, I, I think that you have to, there's been an inexorable chewing up of labor by technology since the Industrial Revolution. That's gonna continue. I think that where we have to challenge ourselves is finding industries and products where the cost of labor adds value. And, and where, that is, where that's present, there's, there's opportunity in American manufacturing. Where it isn't present, uh, barring subsidies or pressure from Washington, it's, it's not. And I think that's... So, so that's very sectoral when you're talking about that. You're willing to abandon shoe manufacturing in America forever and stuff no. like that. No. Or you think it come, can come back because some brand can make Made in America reason you buy that shoe? Yeah, I think, I think that if you look at shoes specifically, uh, if you look at a brand like Allen Edmonds or Red Wing, uh, if they are able to put into the market a product that is resonant with a customer, they've got viability. I think the thing that's interesting about the internet is that it unlocks a customer base without the corresponding burden of retail and wholesale that makes businesses that were previously suffocating under the margin requirements of traditional retail and distribution and gives them a new lease on life. It's not easy, uh, but I think that, that brands like Allen Edmonds are encouraging brands, right? There's a great example of the cost of labor adds, uh, adds value to the product. They're great shoes. If you can eliminate distribution costs, margin costs to make them more priced effectively for the marketplace, that's compelling. And so I think it is by sector. I think there's some sectors like iPhones are not coming back to the US. But there are other sectors, whether it's food or apparel or footwear or other categories, mattresses, where the dynamics of that industry, I think, do unlock interesting opportunities. And I think the technology is going to hurt that and facilitate it at the same time. No, well, Allen Edmonds is a great example. Red Wing is not. I mean, they've been making shoes in America for hundreds of years, and they're going to keep doing it because the family business still owns it. And frankly, they're in it for more than just the money. They have an entire town relying on them to be there. And that's, I think, probably we're in agreement. There will just be more and more companies that come up that profitability is just not their only objective. That telling a greater story, that being authentic. I'm not sure I agree with that. I, 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 will I, become the force that brings back US manufacturing in full. Well, if companies don't make money, those that are retired in this country are going to starve to death because that's where the majority of the retirement funds go. And this economy is a, is a form of social welfare. When you invest, you're asking someone to take the torch, continue to work, drive a profitable business, and provide back to you a portion of those profits so you can eat. That's how it works. So this should matter to everybody in America that the companies that do this for you, when you become an investor one way or another, do it efficiently. So, you know, Tanya, you should have a direct line to the White House given what you do. But, you know, at the end of the day, you must be competing. Every time an entrepreneur sources a manufacturer through you, they must be looking on Alibaba at the cost differential every time. I am imagine they're doing that. I think, and sometimes it, I think it would make sense for someone to compare costs. And, but I think that there's also ways to mitigate beyond um, just the labor costs and design. I think there's a lot of ways to incorporate design and reengineering to make American manufacturing um, viable. For instance, there's 
a manufacturer that we work with in New Jersey, he actually helps our entrepreneurs re-engineer their designs to make it less hum like to make less human interaction within it and more uh, machine interaction so that it drives the cost down. And we've actually been able to um, bring you know, a Chinese made bag and he's able to make it for the exact same cost in New Jersey. You gave me a great segue to the next topic which is very controversial at these, at these dialogues we're having here today and yesterday, robotics and <laughs> job replacement. Now, there is a field of, of, of thinking, uh, an alarmist view in some people's minds that artificial intelligence and automation, particularly in micro-robotics and large robotic systems, is going to completely decimate jobs in this country and practically everywhere around the world. Let's ask this generation of entrepreneurs who should fear this because it's their kids that are going to be most affected by it. How big a concern is that? And they're in multi-sectors here. They're not in just one sector. It's not just the automotive industry. It's in every industry. You can buy a robot now that used to cost a million and a half dollars to pack cupcakes into a jar, it now costs 35,000. And you can whack two employees when you do that. Save about $100,000. So the return is practically immediate. Makes a lot of sense. Do you care? Uh, I'm, actually, I'm actually super excited, but uh, um, I'm actually super excited by the world of robotics and AI, right? So if we Hello? All right, it wins. Um, you know, if we look at the types of products that we're going to want in the future, they're only getting more complicated, they're getting more intricate, more interesting, and we want them cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, right? All of those things lend themselves to, if you want all that stuff to happen, right, then having assistance from whether it's technology and algorithm or whatever it may be is going to yield what we as American consumers want, um, and they're going to be higher quality. At the end of the day, if something can scan a product that we're making and you know check it 1,000 times over within a millisecond as opposed to having seven people do that, um, that's exciting, right? I think the other part of it is that, you know, like we were talking about earlier, this is a problem in the short term because yes, you know, if you bought that robot tomorrow, those two people are gonna be out of a job, right? If we have a long-term view on it, the 10, 20, 30 year viewpoint, which we can actually retrain people, we can actually come up with more meaningful jobs in other sectors for people, then we're actually transitioning the workforce into something more interesting, right? So that we don't have to have everyone just packing cupcakes all day long. Instead, they can be teaching people or they can be adding value to the economy in different ways. And so, um, it's a careful balance, right? Because we don't want to do that at the moment. But I also think, you know, it's not like technology can take over all of our business today, right? Like, for example, making a mattress or making sheets are still very manual processes. It would be very difficult to do that. Like we talk about, you know, like replacing a plumber or electrician, building a robot to do that is actually a very complicated job. Actually, replacing an accountant is a pretty easy thing to, for an algorithm to do. And so they don't like to hear that. Yeah, I'd be more worried if I'm part of that stratosphere of jobs than I would be for people that are in manufacturing. So you, what you're suggesting is perhaps there is a generation in here that's really gonna get screwed in that transition. If you are packing <laughs> cupcakes, that's not so great. Well, I think it's our, I think part of our social responsibility and the reason that we're all here is that we care to make sure that it doesn't happen immediately, right? And so I think if we, if we took a 10-year plan- You think it's even plan, possible to manage the transition? You think the market forces will provide for that? Uh, I think it's our job to make sure that we run our companies in a way in which we can do that. Right? So I've actually been kind of obsessed with this, and I'm actually starting a new company because of this, um, in addition to Maker's Row. So um, I think that a lot of the manufacturing jobs, because I've throughout my time in growing Maker's Row, I visited hundreds of factories. Some of the work is backbreaking work, work that machines could be doing. And I think that there's an opportunity to, in this transition period, train the workforce to start to adapt, to mitigate some of this, and to hopefully not have that transit, that painful transition period that we had in the past. Um, but I do think that and whose it responsibility allows is that to mitigate the pain? Is it the government's responsibility to tax everybody so that you can provide a transition period and buffer the blow? Is that something we do in America very well? We're great at managing government programs. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, With I mean, I think period. it's everyone's responsibility. I think everyone needs to be concerned about it. Pri the private sector, government, like educational system, everyone needs to be concerned about it and be thinking about it. I don't think it should rely, we, I don't think we should all rely on one person or one institution to think like, oh, they're gonna take care of it. We all have to kind of step up and, and consider it. 
just take, let's, let's just ask the audience, because we're going to transition to QA here, but just this question. Would you be prepared, and we'll do it just by hands, to pay 5% more tax <laughs> to help those that are going to lose their jobs in automation and artificial intelligence? And don't lie to yourself. <laughs> Would you pay to do that? Would you actually tax yourself to accommodate a generation that's going to get slaughtered through that process? Anybody willing to do that? Oh, that's a lot. More than you thought, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's a good amount. Not a lot, actually. I'd say about 15%. I was expecting more. And they're the really <laughs> rich ones. <laughs> that's what's going on. It was more than this I thought. Would raise their hand. I, I think this is a big issue, and I've heard a lot of talk about it in the last 48 hours. It's going to be a big deal. And I think some people feel that it is the role of the government to step in here and actually mitigate the pain. But, and that is not the American way. But maybe um, it's not about tax, and maybe it's about the beanie that we come back to. You People should be a politician willing. if you're not calling it tax. People are willing <laughs> to buy the beanie that's supporting their community, and maybe you recognize it when you do. Maybe you don't. If you're shopping at Whole Foods, I'm sure you are making a decision that you're going to spend more money to take better care of your communities. And that's an important thing, I think. Well, let's talk care. about Whole Foods. Who thinks Whole Foods was <laughs> successful or just failed by being eaten alive by Amazon? What happened there? Success or failure? What do you guys think? I think through your paradigm, success. Shareholders right? got bought out? Yeah. 23% yeah. premium to the stock, good outcome, right? But as what's, 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 give me the scenario that's not successful. Suppose it remains to be seen <clears throat> with the integration of automated robots that Amazon will put in, right? Well, I, I would argue that the reason a shareholder would take that offer is they didn't see any value further than this. And, and that's an end of life scenario, and it's not a bad outcome, but clearly Amazon has entered into the grocery space and it will never be the same. The truth about that transaction, those that you are watching, the market cap increase to Amazon in the first minute it was announced actually covered the entire price of the purchase, which tells you the market has spoken. Well, and it killed the market cap of it all the groceries. It took another 15 billion out of the competitors. Yeah. So that is a striking, unprecedented move. I don't recall anything like that before in an M&A transaction, but it's very, very telling. Let's open it up to questions in the audience here. Yes, ma'am. Um, we've been talking a lot about the social value of jobs, the social value of, of you know, your, your various uh, endeavors. What about the social value of the, the number of American consumers who are living paycheck to paycheck and can't afford to be altruistic? Ah, well, I think great that, question. I think, I think some of us here, right, are running essentially direct to consumer companies. And I think part of the, the way we've been looking at it is that, you know, if we talk about there's a 5 to 8% premium, let's say, by manufacturing here, right, we're giving people 70% discounts versus going to a Sleepy's or a local mattress store by selling direct, right? So I think some of it is being offset by business model innovation on a continuing basis because you're not going to need those 4,000 square foot retailers on every corner in which you have commissioned salespeople and, you know, a dramatically inefficient infrastructure. Um, so yeah. you're basically saying you because you're adding efficiencies, you will not make America cost more for people that have to live in America. That somehow we're yeah, going to change. Yeah, it costs a lot less. That's a good counter argument. Let's see if it's true or not. Because right now, Walmart doesn't agree with you. They say they need low cost manufacturing to provide pretty well 70% of the stuff we consume and benefit from at a lower cost. But that's a huge debate. That's, that's great. That's, that's the other cut at, cut at it, I think. I think that the, the, there's one segment of the market that is the that is going to compete on operational efficiency. And I think Walmart is going to do exceptionally well there. And every penny in cross-border border costs matter. And you're going to get three t-shirts for nine bucks. And that is relevant and appropriate for that consumer that you're talking about. There are layers of consumers above that that are participating in brands throughout the pricing spectrum. So in apparel, you've got t-shirts that retail for $3 and 9 and 20 and 40 and 90 and 150 and there's businesses to be built all along the way, from Ralph Lauren all the way down. And so I think it depends on where you're talking about. But I think, uh, just speaking personally, I would celebrate those people that are competing on the operational end of the spectrum. They're satisfying a very important consumer need. But there's also plenty of room for other brands to compete, like Patagonia, that are, are living with higher retail pricing 
in return for those customers that value what Patagonia is bringing to them. And so it's just a, I think it's a nuanced question. I think in the apparel world, there's, there's a, it's a huge category with lots of players and lots of price points. That's a great way to say it. That's that gentleman right over there. Yell it out and we'll repeat it. All right, well, I think one of the questions I have is, you know, underlying all this, are we really talking about a failure of government to operate efficiently in terms of the market? So, for example, if you're asking if we're willing to pay more for job training, I would say we're spending about 20 to $30 billion a year on job training programs right now that are completely obsolete. What if we actually repurpose those to be relevant to today's economy? We might actually have our taxes go down. Um, so uh, that's one area. The other area of government inefficiency could be failing to price in the externalities of offshoring. The fact of the matter is it's expensive to live in this country. It's expensive to manufacture. And there are companies that are arbitraging that by going to uh, manufacture offshore and then bringing stuff in here and want the police and the fire departments and the rule of law to enforce their businesses, but they're arbing that outsource manufacturing that government is not controlling for. So my question is, is a lot of these underlying issues related to the failure of government to be <coughs> efficient and relevant to the market realities of today? And that even ties back into her question. And in the way that like a company is providing consumers with a better product or a better reason to buy a product or a story um, and that authenticity, they're also supporting their communities and hopefully those people will be able to make more money and then be able to afford more as you go along. But tying into what you're talking about, is that the role of government to make sure they are, in fact, paying those people enough to live? Well, I also think it's, it's government, it's education as well, right? So we're sending tons of people through a very expensive education system, loading them up with debt, and then expecting them to, over, what, 30 years, pay back um, you know, and, and take some sort of job. I think the reality is we've got to rethink the entire end of that spectrum, right? Because it doesn't make sense for you to take on $150,000 of debt if you're going to go and make $75,000 a year working in, you know, manufacturing, right? That is a, and so it, it's the entire spectrum that needs to be fixed. Yeah, I, I also think it's, you know, this is one of these moments, I think, in capitalism of just really profound disruption that has happened predictably every 20 or 30 years. And I, and I think that the idea that, that the federal government can navigate that change efficiently enough to stay in front of the job requirements is a big ask. And I think it's, it's an expensive ask. And so at least from my perspective, I think that to the extent that we can bias our dollars and our resources towards liberating entrepreneurialism that are sort of by its nature addressing a lot of these issues, um, I think that uh, ultimately is a more effective way of getting at the problem. Um, because I think Washington's going to sort of feel its way through in the dark, trying to figure out what is the best way to re-educate and retrain with a pace of change that is, for those of us that are in the middle of it, is mind-bending. It's very hard to stay, stay abreast of it. So I think it sort of tethers back to your question, I think, a little bit, too. Well, I, you know, one, one thing I'd like you to answer is the previous generations of entrepreneurs, the words they feared the most were, hi, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. Yeah. Is that changed? Is that what I'm hearing you say? that you would like to see the government get involved in these transitional issues in your generation of entrepreneurs? You think this, look, look, that's <laughs> what I'm hearing. I think <laughs> Certainly not in our case. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I speak a lot on this issue. I think, you know, we've got a southeastern, predominantly a southeastern-based supply chain, and from cut and sew in North Carolina all the way down through yarning and ginning cotton. And one of the real challenges that we face is in communities that have 14 or 15 percent unemployment, uh, we cannot get uh, labor for entry-level, unskilled, minimum wage jobs. And, uh, and so I think, you know, to, to the extent that we can focus our energies on, on, on addressing some pretty fundamental questions around why is there a gap, if you look at the manufacturing sector all across the country, there is a gap between jobs that are open and, and unskilled so workers that want them. You're suggesting bad policy created that problem. I am. And I think, cool. that, I, I think that there's also a, a, a lot of, in our case anyway, and we've got hundreds of sewers in places like North Carolina, that there's just a certain level of navigating the bureaucratic framework around running businesses in places like the Carolinas that make work more difficult than it ought to be, in my mind. I think in New York, we also had an issue, especially with the zoning um, for our factories, where a lot of our manufacturers are getting pushed out because of the new zoning laws. And I think that that, like, I think on the local level is where government can really excel in helping um, small businesses specifically. Well, now you're talking about deregulation, right? That's what you're asking for, municipal and state deregulation. 
whole different <laughs> panel for that oh. one. That's a great <laughs> conversation. Let's, uh, there's a question down there. So about, I'd say maybe 10%, maybe 15% of the panels that have been presented this week are on robotics and related technology. Knowing that your business are going to be affected by this, how much time are you spending today thinking about how to incorporate robotics into your businesses and transitioning your current business plan to incorporate future technologies? I probably spend about 25% of my time thinking about it. I wouldn't say that we're actively in progress. I mean, the, the challenge is in like, in manufacturing businesses, it's actually pretty difficult and the CapEx involved you know, especially for small companies. Like, for us to vertically integrate and build a plant, we're talking about about $20 million, right? If we automate that plant, we're probably talking about $30, $40 million. So I think there's a certain level of scale that's required at which point it, it starts to make sense on huge operations. Um, but that said, I, I think that we're also limiting it, you know, in terms of the manufacturing side. Like, AI is also having dramatic uh, reductions for us in terms of, you know, being able to to dramatically impact our cost structure when it comes to things like customer service, right? Like we've got our inbounds are all screened by an AI tool so that we can route them to the right place and figure out, you know, should actually we be automatically answering this with a likely answer or routing it to a specialist? So there will be different places where, uh, you know, it's gonna have an impact over time. And in our case, not much on robotics, but a lot on uh, re-engineering factory floors, a lot of the Toyota systems are, are taking hard looks at things like work in process and inventory loading and throughput of factories. And those are, those are very important. It's not robotic specifically, uh, but it is looking at, you know, throughout our supply chain, how to be as efficient as we can from logistics to throughput to work in process to keep that American burden as, li as light as we can. You know what? I don't know if you guys have seen this, but like what we found is that the state of most of the factories that we worked with yeah. before we came in was not great. Yeah, it's right? If you went to a Chinese factory, yep. you were seeing automation, Absolutely. state of the art, right? Yep. TSS, you're seeing yep. like some of the most advanced technology. When we first started walking into our barns in South Carolina where a product was made, there were just like sewing yep. machines, sheets <laughs> everywhere, you know, people not, you know, there was no technology on the factory floor. And so we've had a big part in actually introducing technology yep. and process into these places so that they can stay competitive. Yep. We've seen that a lot too. And what I would challenge you to do with Makers Row is figure out a way to make working with US manufacturers uniform because that's one of the <coughs> things we keep coming back to is like even you go to a new manufacturer and we find many of ours through Makers Road, not to keep plugging our, but other <laughs> sites we find too as well that can connect us and create those relationships. But then they really, in a lot of cases, don't know what they're doing. They don't even know how to provide you with like a regular invoice in a lot of cases. They don't know how to take credit cards. They can't deal with us on like a basic level and even get us the information to our fulfillment center to make it happen in a cohesive manner. And so if there is a way to make that something that like manufacturers can have as tools because they are pretty far behind their Chinese counterparts. Yes, sir. A short story to introduce a question about the 8%. GE Appliances used to employ 30,000 people in Louisville, Kentucky, making ranges, refrigerators, microwaves, and things like that. They moved all that overseas to Asia in the uh, prior generation of GE leadership. In the last five years, they have found that it's actually lower cost to bring that production back to Louisville. And they're building it, and, they, and this is in the press, they're making appliances and pretty manual intensive processes in Louisville, Kentucky at a better price point than they could make them overseas. And a key point there was looking at the whole value stream, which is you buy a refrigerator or a microwave at Home Depot, they get it from a, a, a warehouse, the warehouse reorders it from the factory. Well, if your factory's in Louisville, Kentucky, that warehouse doesn't have to keep nearly as much inventory. They can accommodate the changes and the evolution and the speed of the technology and the evolution of the product. So my question is, my impression is that some of the people that are doing the analysis about do I really save the 8% or not, in terms of where are not getting full information yep, totally or good that. advice about how to make those calculations. You've introduced a lot of complexities about the way the business is changing. So I'd like to get hear some comments from the panel about uh, how your generation of leaders maybe can get more information because there may be cases when it's actually more profitable to make it here based on lead time, variety, and the things you've all talked about. And the speed of evolution of the product. Engineering changes, evolution of the product, life cycle of the product. 
I would just add to that. I, it makes no sense to analyze a business based on purely the cost of a widget alone, made here or made in China. If you analyze the entire cost stack and look at the marketing burden, the distribution burden, the retailing burden, the margin burden, the markdown burden, the inventory burden, and look at a full spectrum view, uh, analyze it that way, we share it completely with what you're saying, is that the apparel industry is, I would argue, is the, is the greatest offender in that way, that because labor has been the dominant cost factor in apparel, brands have taken the easiest route, which is to chase the lowest regulation and the lowest cost of labor wherever it would take them, first to Mexico, then to China, then to Bangladesh. But if you begin to rethink that and rethink inventory and rethink throughput in the floor and think about Toyota's engineering systems and, and how you're putting product through, uh, much more of the call stack gets liberated, particularly with the advent of the internet and inventory management practices that I agree with you. I think there's, it's, a, it's a dirty little secret for us. We love it. But there's a whole bunch of people that are telling you that you can't make great quality, affordable American products in the clothing world anymore. We're sort of happily disagreeing and quietly building a business. And so I, I agree with that. that 100 percent. I mean, we talked about this prior to the panel. Uh, the pushback on that, though, is this. Um, let's take a commodity, not a commodity, but a product that pretty well everybody in this room has, your iPhone. If you decided that somehow you could mitigate the cost differential, optimistically decided that you could bring it all back home and bring back those two million jobs to America to make the iPhone, how many people would be willing to pay the difference? when Samsung, who's got more market share globally, will remain the low-cost provider and continue to compete with a product that everybody buys significantly cheaper. I don't think that's going to work. I think that's a very, very difficult challenge. I think that boat has sailed. The GE example is interesting. GE is beyond a company. It's become an index. It has so many different businesses. Unfortunately, for the last 17 years, it's been where money goes to die. <laughs> if you're an investor, you don't put your money there because you are so underperforming the S&P. And I'm not trying to make a decision on management here. I'm just telling you what happened. And so whatever they were doing, they were not keeping pace with every other company in America, whatever it was. And I think these are harsh realities that we all have to face. I'm obviously, uh, you know, want to be pro provocative about this debate because in the end, I'm going to ask all of you here, after we've had these discussions and answered these questions, whether or not you really believe in your heart of hearts that America is going to become a huge manufacturing base again. Let's answer another question first. I'm actually from uh, North Carolina as well, so I understand those uh, unemployment numbers. But I think uh, Mr. O'Leary actually uh, quantified it correctly that uh, almost a whole generation is going to be kind of put out of work based on because of automation and because of robotics because the real numbers are you have 30 percent of uh, high school students going to college. That means you have 70 percent of students who aren't going to college to gain um, a higher education and say let's let's assume 20 percent of those students who aren't gaining that higher education are getting skilled or uh, getting a skill or going to community college or something, you still have 50% of the population that doesn't have a skill. So what do you, what do you think in the future is actually going to save that 50% of the population that's not going to have a skill, that's not going to be able to go to community college and needs to work immediately after high school because they have a low income family they have to take care of? They can come work for our manufacturers because going back to what you said, they need the work, the labor force to come in and do it. But a lot of times they're unwilling to even yeah. take those jobs. But and I think it'll just adjust over time and then um, they'll, they'll take on those jobs. They'll be, maybe somebody needs to go market better for those jobs because I hear this all the time from manufacturers. Well, here's a millennial saying up. other millennials are <laughs> lazy. No, but I'm not I think saying true. that. But, I'm but, saying that they haven't been trained properly or even been told that those are good jobs to take. They've been like told that those are the bad jobs in society and that's mm. not right. We need to go back there's also a work glory time. I think there's also jobs. a workforce mobility problem, though, right? Like uh, uh, compared but, to but, but what Zachary just said is they don't want to do that work. I don't know, if and they'd rather do no work than that work. You that may be that? true for some subset of the population, right? But I also That's think that, that part of this is that we've got very concentrated manufacturing areas, right? So you look at the Carolinas, you look at LA, you look at you know there's 
centers of density where we're making stuff. And then if you look at other places, we're not making anything, right? And so if you grew up, for example, in a region that traditionally has not made something, but now you're looking for a job, you know, people in America don't tend to move. It's very different than Europe where people will go and move 500 miles to get a job. Like that just doesn't happen very much. So I think also culturally, you know, we've got to start shifting to a place where either we're going to start diversifying where we're manufacturing stuff, right? And it's going to have to be made all over so that those jobs exist in, in many more of our states, or there's going to need to be some workforce, you know, mobility initiatives where, you know, you could start shuttling people. Because like we make stuff in Atlanta and it is actually very challenging to find um, people to take those jobs, but there are definitely people in other regions that want them. I think I agree with you with the workforce mobility, but I also think that manufacturing jobs have like a branding issue. I've always found it interesting that a, a graduate or someone that just graduated from college is willing to take a retail job or a job at a coffee shop for $10 an hour, but they're not willing to take a factory job for $20 an hour. Um, and, and I think it's a branding issue. It's the same exact work. It's just as boring. And, like, or if, it, if it is just as boring, like if they're getting paid at least double. I found um, like one of our manufacturers that's doing it well is um, the one producing our leather patches. Our leather comes from Red Wing Boot Company because it's waterproof, so you can wash the beanies. And then it goes up to Adam, and Adam stamps them and cuts them out and stuff and sews them on. But he has iPads for his workers. He has them, like, they can connect to the Sonos system, play their own music. They're all friends. And it's becoming a younger um, millennial generation that are taking those jobs because they want to go work for him. And I think that's what yeah. our US manufacturing operations need to adjust to. Yeah. But if you ask Adam, his intention is to start buying up those manufacturing plants because in a lot of cases, they're run by too old of a generation that feels like they got screwed over by Chinese manufacturers taking their jobs that they're not even willing to adjust anymore and take on new systems to run these plants. And so it's going to take a younger force to move those manufacturers in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. I see factories. Let's answer a couple more questions. I'm cognizant of time here. Gentleman on the aisle. Well, I have two, uh, two issues that I would say we would discuss. One is um, you were talking about the younger generation not going to college. And how about everybody that's over 55 that has a job that's now being replaced? Now, even if they get retooled to relearn a new job, they're going to be working for a lot less than they were making, say, at a job they were there for 20 years. That's the one issue which I don't think is a solvable problem, and I think, as you said earlier, the older generation is screwed, and hopefully their children will help them. Uh, the second thing that I, I... Boy, are you ever dreaming. Well, hopefully in some cases, <laughs> maybe. But in, in other cases, I'm also a manufacturer for about 50 years, and I manufacture in the United States, and I still do, as well as I manufacture in China, India, and in Spain. And the difference, and I've used technology in every which way where I've lowered my manufacturing cost in America by 50%. But even with my 50% um, reduction, it's still 20 to 30% cheaper for me to manufacture in China or many times in Spain. And there's no answer to that, and I've used every type of technology. And the issue with China is, let's say you have a machine that costs a million, two, million and a half, two million dollars to build. They'll buy one machine, they'll take it apart, copy the machine, and make it for 100,000 and make 10 of them. And they'll have the same efficiencies that we have in America with a much lower cost of labor. As well as in China, <coughs> which I know is a, a factor in my industry, is that for uh, 10 years, the Chinese government rebated to all the manufacturers 25% the, the, the selling price to America in order to put all the American and English manufacturers out of business. In five years, they put every, about 100 manufacturers out of business. And when there was nobody left, the Chinese government took away the incentive, and now the Chinese prices went up. But it's still, even with a higher price, still more, much cheaper to manufacture in America. And I find in, you're talking about value, making in America. I make in America, and it's 30% cheaper. When I go to somebody and I say, this is made in America, this is... Um, made with sweat and blood of American Americans, but it's this much more money. 95% say, well, that's great that you're doing that, but we're going to buy the cheaper product. Even if it's the same quality, we're going to pay and buy the Chinese product. So I don't know if there's any answers. I mean, you're up there with the many small companies with small manufacturers. You go, like your example of a car company, that would be maybe one of the good examples, or any of the big machinery companies. Well, I think the interesting vote we had a few minutes ago was one where I asked, who would be willing to pay more to soften the blow of all of these issues? 
and basically nobody was. Few people, but the truth is, everybody looks at it, I think, and you can certainly jump in on this conversation, that every generation faces its challenges and somehow we solve it in America as we have for 200 years. And what's different about this time? Nothing. It's just another challenge and we face it. It's got a lot of concerned people running around, particularly on the robotics topic. But I heard people screaming about television that way in my lifetime, wiping out <laughs> radio. So maybe it's just not that big a deal. How do you people feel about that? I, I think to say it's not a big deal, I think, is maybe trivializing the impact it's having. But I think it's, it is the natural evolution of capitalism. I think it's also important to recognize that it is You're not very, in the camp that in 20 years China owns everybody, including us. No, I think that it's, this, it's very early in what is happening with technology and commerce. It is very early. I think we don't even understand the implications of what Amazon's distribution network and the lightening of that load might do to agriculture and produce with the acquisition of Whole Foods. I don't think we even understand yet the implications of that. I don't think we understand. That's very optimistic of you. Oh, I'm very optimistic. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think that's not to say, though, that it doesn't in places like North Carolina have r rough impacts. I rode into the in from the airport this morning with a guy that is trying to uh, retrain and replace West Virginia coal miners. That's real. That's real. Like that's hard, disruptive, ugly. There's going to be a lot of that. But I also think there's going to be a lot of new industries that are opening up and that are. I mean, I think. You know, maybe I'm guilty of living in the Bay Area, but, but it, is, it, is, uh, it is incredibly optimistic what is happening out there right now in all, all aspects of industry right now. Oh, well, with robotics as well, and with your G example, that could happen, um, that Apple ends up figuring out that it would work better to bring back many jobs now, probably many less than they would have used in China. Um, but it would be cost effective because of the AI and the robotics to bring it back to the US and then bring back jobs here as well. And so there are th certain things that we don't even know about yet that could even be bringing jobs back in here. I mean, part of the big reason you're doing this with mattresses is because they're so heavy. Yeah, logistics. So I mean, the time has come to ask the question <laughs> to the audience. We're done here now. We have two minutes left. You've heard all this. We've debated a few things and answered questions and raised a few issues here. How many people in this room think America is going to bring back manufacturing like it was 40 years ago? 40, 40 years ago, the peak, the peak. Are we ever gonna get back to what we were? Practically nobody. How many people does that really bother? No, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Wrong question, I think. What if we don't want to go back to that? We want to go to a different yeah, style. Progress. We want progress. Yeah, it's going <laughs> to. So the truth is, well, this is a self inflicted angst. That's what I think it is. Yeah. It's, that's what it is. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.